of my story will begin at the end of May and I was then in the infantry, the Leicestershire Regiment. We had been transferred to boost the air, uh, the artillery and what not. No, 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 we had been transferred from the artillery to boost the infantry regiments because they had had such a boast in it, Normandy. I don't think people realised what a bloodletting it was in Normandy. And I was then, we was outside Arnhem. It was the 49th British Division who served all through that part of the war with the Canadians. The Canadians were a bit short and I was in the, in the second, uh, first Leicesters. Um, we was waiting there, we, we'd actually successfully gone into uh, we'd captured Arnhem and then it all come to a stop. We didn't know why, plenty of rumours, but it appeared uh, some neutral country, see the Dutch in the rest of Holland, the north, they were starving, especially in the cities, they were no food or anything. And I don't know what you, what it was, what, who did negotiate with the Germans. We thought the Germans, we had stopped advancing because the Germans was going to flood the rest of the country. But apparently, and I don't know what you, what it was, they had negotiated with the Germans to get food to these starving Dutch. And we had the situation, which they agreed to, of the Canadians, we were sitting, we was really with the Canadians, <coughs> of seeing Canadian lorries driving from our lines through into the German lines, taking them food, which has been forgotten, I suppose. But, uh, and then later on, we understood the Germans had decided they had got to give in, the German commander. And he negotiated a surrender. And I don't know the dates, but it, would, it must have been about the time. And we went into Holland, and it's most peculiar really, because there were the German soldiers with their weapons and everything, and there was us, and there was this truce, so we was putting up with one another. And <coughs> then a proper negotiation was brought in, and we was then transferred, or rather the regiment went into Holland itself, I can remember all the Dutch all singing and cheering and <laughs> that sort of thing. And we finished up in Hilversum. Now that is was familiar to us because it had a radio station in English during the war. So that's familiar. And we was put in there where well, they had it. And we was in there and we, it must have been there, the, the, I just, I, the formal war, and I can't remember whether it was Churchill or whether it was the king, but we listened on the radio, and I believe it was Churchill, telling the rest of the world, like the Germans and formally surrendered and we 
heard this, I then be stood up and say, <laughs> not God save the king. <laughs> and we'd got a bottle of whiskey, and then we had a drink, and that was, and then we went to bed. And that was the only celebration he had because they told us the following day we were going to be very busy, which we was. And we got up the second day, first thing in the morning, and <coughs> we then, the German, it was arranged with the Germans to send the Hermann Gerwin Parachute Regiment. I didn't know that they belonged to the Hermann Gerwin, but they did. And later in the day, the first of these men came down to where we were and to surrender formally. They was wearing their uniforms and with their weapons, got all their weapons and everything and their tin hats and they formally, and they, there was no rancor at all between them. We, we were very correct with one another. We, we more or less respect, we both sides respected that we had been fighting troops. So we had a sort of a, but he, he came down and they came down and they came to where I, a lot of us was there. And they laid down their rifles in a pile and their other things in a pile. And all their ammunition was taken off of them, and because they, they was dressed as though they were going back into the front line, uh, and some talk, somewhere along the line, somewhere there, we had a disaster. Now, did you know or heard of a Panzer fist? That was a very powerful rocket weapon, and the Germans. Were very fond of it, and there were, must have whether there was a, a lorry or, or or whatever, they blew up. And they now I can say this, and I can say it with all the thing. I was there all of a sudden, and they always understood that sound travels in a way from the source. And I can well remember this huge cloud rising up with no noise. And it was these precipices blowing up. And, and then they all came down again. And, we, and there were hand grenades and bombs going off all, all over the show, not lately. And we went in to see if we could find anybody. Now, the only medical, that what I can remember, I, I had another, he, he was a German, we got hold of a man and we dragged him out and he kept saying, mother, 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 that's all he could say. And we dragged him out and the, the the only medical there was a German doctor, and I got to give him. He went to those who needed him most. It didn't matter whether they was English, whoever they were. I've got to give a that. Well, it all settled down, and it was all very calm. Afterwards, we settled down. Well, by the way, <laughs> we had actually stopped to have our tea. Being British, we had to stop and have air tea. But anyway, you know, we uh, we went from there. There was a signaler missing, and didn't matter what we did, we couldn't find where this man was. Now the odd thing was that this man had only joined the regiment that week. Nobody knew. Recognised him or do of him. I just know he was a new bloke, and 
so the officer could only say this signaller was missing and he couldn't give any reason why he was missing and he'd done a, done a run up, frightened of the bomb because he was uh, new to us, nobody recognised him or heard of him and then the following morning they seriously looked into why this man was missing. And they come to the conclusion. Now, somebody, a self, one of the drivers, said, oh, he said, there was a bloke here, one of the blokes, he said, I did recognise him, I didn't know him. He said, uh, he was asking me, he'd, he, he, where were the Germans being surrendered? Because he wanted to go and see it. And he, and he said, uh, they, he had no idea who he was and everything. Well, from that, it's a little bit complicated. I've got to get my brain working. Uh, we decided, I decided to put him down as missing. Now, the signal platoon, or words, had lost more men that afternoon because they'd been, the, uh, they had in the first part of the, you know, the war coming up, and they had lost 14 men. Had been, uh, of course, I formerly, uh, this, but this man was missing. He wasn't amongst them. And they, I couldn't understand it. And I, I realised in the end, he, had been at the source of the explosion and he had been blown up with it and that was the only way we could get over it. Well we went on from there and we finished uh, we went from there to divide uh, the Germans they were disarming them you see and there was no sign of this man whatsoever. There was no clue as to why or what had happened. And we come to the conclusion he had been at the source of the explosion. Because, well, I'm getting a bit too far. Then there was a, I noticed there was a, a Dutchman. And what I best know about this Dutchman, he had, great big blue clogs on. I remember that more than anything else. And he was talking to my officer. And then in the end, my officer came out and he said to me, oh, that civilian said, there's a body in the woods. And he said, uh, take, two, take two German soldiers with you and a stretcher. And he said, go and collect him. So I went off following the Dutchman with his blue clogs. I always remember these blue clogs. And he, he never spoke, he never said a word. I suppose the reason being he hadn't got his English quite good enough to do so. And we walked and we kept walking and we kept walking. And I thought, well, where are we going? We went right out of the, into the countryside, or it's into the countryside. And finally he stopped and he indicated what we'd come out for, we would find in the wood. So I went into the wood, and I could only describe it as I'm telling you, word for word. Laying in the brambles and everything was what had been a human being. He completely blasted. And I, and then, so what we did, no identity on him whatsoever. And somehow or other, we had a job to do it. We helped, got him onto the stretcher, and we brought him back. And I reported to my officer what I'd done. 
and I said, and he said, I said, but there was nothing, there was no identifying anything whatsoever. I said, but there was one thing I did notice. He said, what was that? I said, he was wearing a signaler's belt. Now, the signalers used to have a special belt to help him with their thing, you see. And I said, he was wearing a signaler's belt. He said, but all the signalers have been accounted for. And he realised it was this bloke. And we then, I must get this right now. We went on, and this fella had only joined the regiment that week. And he had been in the army since the beginning of the war. This is what came out when they started looking into it. Uh, and he'd never been overseas, never done any active service. Then he had been picked <coughs> to come out to reinforce the infantry. And we could only believe that he was at the source of the explosion and he had been completely blown up. And that was the only way we could explain it. So, well, that was sorted out. We then, now the signal platoon had lost 14 men in this business, which was more than I'd lost during the campaign up through right where we go. But uh, we went on then from there. We, the fella who was missing was just put, see, you, you can't put down any old thing. He was put down as being missing. And he left it at that. Well, then we formally, the, uh, there was the formal uh, burial of the, the uh, set of the 14 signals. You know, all the flags was at half mast. All the dignities and the people were there, and so were crying, and her own there, and one thing or another. And he, they was buried there uh, uh, in, in this cemetery. And to my knowledge, they're still there. I don't think they've removed them, uh, like they do sometimes. 